It's now 6 p.m. in the capital of Ukraine, Kyiv. Uh, it is a, this is a stunningly beautiful city, but it does not always look like this at night because it, for many, many weeks, uh, we've not been able to turn the lights on in the city uh, because of, first of all, the danger of, of airstrikes, but also because of cuts to electricity. There have been a lot of airstrikes that have hit uh, infrastructure in this country. So to see the uh, the skyline of, uh, of Kyiv lit the way it is tonight is something that a lot of people are celebrating in a country that it's, uh, it's hard to find things to celebrate. Uh, a year into this war. As you walk around the city, you can see the ongoing war is taking a toll on people here. Beautiful villages and historic locations have been reduced to rubble by constant shelling. Ever since the Russians started their full-scale assault on the country, I've been speaking to lawmakers and civilians about their experiences here on the ground. It's really hard to put all of this into words. Here's an interaction I had with a member of the Ukrainian parliament, Yevhenia Kravchuk, in Poland back in March. It's hard for you. I can see that it's hard for you. You're just watching the images of what's going on in your country, and, and you, it's hard to process. I'm not watching images. I live in it. Yeah. It's not that, you know, uh, maybe part of the world watch this like a movie, but if you do watch this like a movie, then in this movie has to be a happy end. And what we teach to our children that, you know, the basic rule that uh, the good has to defeat evil has to win. That's, you know, the structure of, of the whole, you know, our system and our democratic world. Well, then we need help to defeat this evil. That is what Yevhenia Kravchuk told me nearly a year ago in the early days of this war. She joins me now uh, in front of this city that looks quite beautiful and for the moment peaceful tonight, but it's not. Well, yes, because uh, you have um, on our back St. Sophia, which is more than 1,000 years old. But on, on our front, we have a whole bunch of junk uh, Russian tanks that yeah. were uh, destroyed by Ukrainian army. And we have this exhibition on this uh, very square, uh, just to remind that Russians uh, will be kicked out and all of the up tanks and whatever they bring will look like that. You and I, when we met in Poland, I was coming east into Ukraine. You were going west. You were going to the United States to try and rally for more help. You, your daughter was still here in Ukraine. And, and, it, and she is and still she is here. here. And, and she was waiting for you to come back with news that America will help. What's yes, changed since then? Exactly. Probably just uh, what we ask about this help. We already got, uh, you know, artillery, high marses, which is, you know, probably the most popular uh, type of weapon in Ukraine. Everyone, a child knows what is yeah. high mars. Uh, you know, now we got these tanks, uh, and now every child would tell you that we need F-16. <laughs> wow. And and. You have, it's been such a constant effort to try and get the West to do this, but it has happened. In each time it's happened, there seems to be a line with these F-16s. Do you think that that line will crumble and that you'll get them? Uh, yeah, I really do believe we will get them eventually. And it's very important to start training before, you know, the political decision will be taken because the training will take some time. And until the time we, you know, get the jets, uh, our pilots will know how to fly them. So that's, I think, very important. But we also had this, you know, political decisions being taken on uh, artillery and uh, MLRS systems such as HIMARS and then on tanks. And uh, every time, uh, you know, the decision was taken. So we believe that uh, there is, you know, very high possibility that F-16 will be flying in Ukraine by Ukrainian pilots to get, uh, you know, uh, liberate our land. That's it. You know, a year ago there was there was concern that the Ukrainian military may not be up to facing the Russian military and won't be able to use all this equipment anyway and all that. Where are we now? Now you're talking about Ukrainians haven't flown F-16s. You guys flew, flew MiG jets. You're going to train Ukrainian pilots to fly a completely new technology. But the last year has demonstrated that Ukrainians seem to be able to learn any weaponry they're given. I mean, it, your life uh, depends on that. You, you do have to learn really fast. And our pilots are making incredible things, incredible things on these old Soviet era jets. Imagine what they do on a new jet. What is your sense of, of where we are right now? This is coming up to one year on this war. Um, you, as members of parliament, you spend a lot of time in Europe trying to get, make sure that your European partners are, are staying, uh, you know, committed to this, this fight. What, what happens next? What's the next step in this thing after we mark a year of this war? 
Well, of course, we believe that 2023 will be victorious for Ukraine. And um, I mean, uh, when we have enough of equipment to do this big counterattack uh, to, to, to get the rest of the south, we already did that with Kherson, with Kharkiv region. You could see these pictures and videos of people crying when they saw Ukrainian soldiers coming into Kherson or Kharkiv region. So the same thing will be in, on, on other territories that are waiting and still uh, occupied. But also we have to understand that it's not just it, it doesn't stop with military victory. It also has to go further with uh, tribunal for political and military leadership of Russia and also for Ukrainian reconstruction um, using also frozen Russian assets uh, to, to rebuild uh, our country. You, you've, see, you've shown these videos how uh, many, many cities look like. They, they look like after World War II, literally. So uh, not just um, this, uh, you know, final help uh, to push Russians away, but also the, um, you, you know, they have to pay for what they did, both in tribunal, but both with the reconstruction. Everybody in this country in some way is fighting the war, whether you're in politics or you're in the military or in the civil defense, but you're still our people and you've got this, this little daughter. Uh, and I, I've heard this segment when you told about the teenager, how teenagers yeah. uh, uh, live. So, um, uh, you know, just not long ago, we had uh, the St. Valentine's Day and she went to school, but there was an air siren again. So when uh, the, the air siren, they had to, uh, had to go to bunker to uh, basement and they and she brought together from home this little hearts and they decorated bunker. Wow. <laughs> Because uh, even during the war, you have to leave your life. <laughs> uh, may they not have to decorate bunkers for next Valentine's Day. I really Day. hope yeah. not that she will have a normal ninth year, you know, old childhood. <laughs> yeah, well, let's hope so. Thank you. Good to see you again. Thank uh, you. I'll see you next in New York. Yevhenia <laughs> Kravchuk is a member of parliament and a deputy leader, leader of the liberal centrist servant of the People Party.